leadership, the dean of the College of Engineering, and the newly appointed provost, Jeff Goldberg. I've always been a person that I think has some skills in both being able to go deep on the technical side of projects and also see the, the business side of things. And one of the things that I learned from business school from Chicago and from McKinsey was this ability to go back to the fundamentals of what the drivers are of a business and understand it conceptually and then figure out the direction we want to take for products in the mm -hmm. context of where we think that business is going. Mm -hmm. And that kind of exercises the corporate strategy side of, of, I have two remits. I lead corporate strategy for Microsoft and then I lead an organization called um, Core Services Engineering and Operations, which is basically the operations of the company, um, how we do transactioning and all the core systems we build. Um, but I've always been good, pretty, I've always thought myself fairly good at bringing uh, a, an overall business strategy bent towards engineering. And so there are lots of times in engineering projects where people, program managers or developers come to you and they'll show you the coolest thing in the world they've, they've just done. And if you step them back, you know, the question I asked more often than not is, so tell me how somebody's going to adopt this product, this mm -hmm. particular product or feature. And they could not give you a plausible set of steps where an end user, for instance, would discover this feature, would find it useful given all the machinations and complexities mm -hmm. required the way they thought about designing it, and then it would get critical mass. They hadn't thought about how competitors had products, um, et cetera. And so one thing is just this melding the, of the two together. Um, the second thing is I've, and this may seem kind of cliche, but I've always focused on what the right thing is to do for the company that I worked for. Mm -hmm. And I've been kind of intentionally very apolitical and said, what's just, you know, my heart is with Microsoft. What's the best thing for the company? And I always tell students that if you do the right thing, the right thing will happen for your career. And I firmly believe that as opposed to you see a lot of people that kind of game, you know, like how will I be perceived, and et cetera. I, I just think in the end that people see through all of that. <laughs> and that's been, um, and so I've just never chosen to play that. It's like, what do I think the right thing to do is? What do you, um, you know, how do you, um, present that to the right people to get them on board, et cetera. I think the, the third thing I would say is to there are certain times in your career when you do have to realize that it's not going in the direction you mm -hmm. may want and you have to give it a little nudge. I've done that a couple of times in my career at, the, at key times when I thought managers were not necessarily supporting me as much as I would have thought. And I'd say, hey, I don't think this is a reasonable um, position to be in. And I've kind of nudged things. So you've nudged it. What is, what is it a like nudge? Like said, hey, I see the situation in my career differently. And ah. if this is, um, we should have a discussion about that. So you have and to have the ability to go to the management and, and, say, and, and say, hey, we need to, to have a talk here. I yeah. think 80% of the time management is, if you are a good performer, 80% of the time management looks after you and pushes things forward. I think mm -hmm. that 20% of the time, and you have to select the 20%, you actually have to be your own advocate and get in there and, and say, hey, I think you see things slightly differently. I think all of the skills of working with people and realizing that you need to get to a consensus for the right thing to happen. I think early in my career, it was all about I knew I was right and let me kind of you know, just prove to you through your might that I was right. People like to work with people they like and they like mm -hmm. to be brought into the conversations. Mm -hmm. Like today, you know, I, do, I bring the, together all of the people and each of the different areas of software we're developing, I bring together all of the stakeholders, the partners, and we get in a room and we walk through all of it once a month. And at the end of it, I consciously say, are we all still on the same page? Or, and I, cons I um, consciously say, is there anybody who has anything else to offer or to add to that? Offer seems too fuzzy, but is there anything, anybody didn't get to speak? And that ability to bring everybody together and to allow people to object has been, and, and to really, at the end of the day, you will walk out of there and say, you know, this is a tough road we're going down, but we all agree, and we all agree this is mm. the right way to go. At Microsoft in particular, when it comes to our internal systems, we've screwed it up so many times. What we do is, and you, I think this is fairly common in engineering, 
is that you take somebody who's good as an individual contributor and you say, oh, they must be a good manager. So you just promote them. That we do it at Microsoft, and so you end up with these people that were great technical contributors, and yet they're just not good managers. And so we have learned from that, and we try to gauge people on, we have one of the, one of the measures in our review process now is, did you contribute to the success of others? Mm -hmm. And did you make others great? And did they contribute to the overall success of the team, not of their own individual contribution? But we don't have actually a management development program that says once you pop out of it, you're yeah, a yeah. manager. What we do have is once you get in to become a manager, we have a set of, of courses that you do go to um, that help you become a better mm -hmm. manager. That ha and we do, uh, we do a lot of use of coaches. And so if somebody isn't you know, naturally fall, um, becoming a good manager, we actually give them a coach. And they choose their coach based on who they get along with, and they help yeah. them work through it as wow. well. So I, there was a manager who um, told me, I think my job is allocation of resources. Mm. And I think that's only a part of your yeah. job. That is enabling stuff to happen. But I try to be known as a manager that can go very deep and yet to do it in a way that is enabling of the people, not mm -hmm. jumping on top of them. So, for instance, I receive every SEV0 or SEV1 bug that, or mm -hmm. alert that happens in the company for my, for my team. Diversity inclusiveness, we believe, is, is critical for two reasons. We want to be an organization that embraces people from the entire spectrum of humanity and brings those ideas in. We, it, it's not just enough to bring them in. You have to actually make it an environment where people feel good about it um, and feel like this is a home. It's, Satya had a, a comment that I thought was really telling. He said that, you know, we all spend enough time at Microsoft. You need to be, this place needs to be a place where you can accomplish some of the mission that you have in life. Mm -hmm. And if it's not, you probably ought to think about another place Correct. to go because you spend so much time here. And we want to live into that kind of a place where we all work super hard, but this, it can have that duality of I'm accomplishing something for the company and for my personal life as well. And, and diversity inclusiveness, there, it has to be a world where everybody can, can live and, and thrive and feel comfortable. I think they are changing a little bit. And I can't, actually this is a place where I can't speak to um, all companies because I haven't been involved in all companies, but obviously. Um, <laughs> at Microsoft, we have gone from a world where as you get up to a certain level, um, you can be a general manager and manage the projects as they move forward. And the, the scales are so large that there's value in having that general management and leadership capability. When I led office, it was $25 billion in revenue, and you really have to keep your hands on everything from a business perspective to be able to, mm -hmm. you know, you're, think about it, you're, you got a $25 billion. That's um, a B, billion with yeah, a B. Bill, oh, yeah. And yeah. you need to grow it at 10%. So you need to grow a $2.5 billion company every year. I, used to, I tell people it's a pernicious amount of stress. And mm -hmm. you really have to have your hands on where is the industry going, what are the trends we're going to catch, what, are, what do you need to do to um, meet the, comp the uh, customer needs on an ongoing basis, where are those customer needs changing over a period of time. It's a, so that's a bi very big business strategy question and, and set of, of, of remits. It has moved, as the industry has gone deeper, the amount of technical competency of those leaders has to go up, and it has gone up. And so one of the things we've done to drive that shift, and it happened actually just as I was leaving, we all, as, as I was leaving to do healthcare.gov, we agreed on doing a reorganization to being a functional organization. So we would have a, an EVP of development of Windows. Mm -hmm. We would have an EVP of office development. And the business side of things actually got pulled away into somebody who, was com who has had that as their core competency. What that does, it had the, the challenges there is it means that the decision, on, unless there's good working across the different functions, every decision in theory could go up to Satya because you, it is a different leader that leads product development versus uh, marketing versus field sales force. And that actually just changed in the past five years. So I would say because wow. of the technical, de to answer your question directly, because of the technical depth in our industry, it has gone much more functional and much more deep. And as a result, leaders like myself need to be able to go all the way down to the metal to understand what's going on.
But you also have to have that competency in business because Terry, for instance, in Windows, Terry Meyerson makes a ton of decisions on the product side that has massive business implications. Mm -hmm. And so he has to be a business leader as well. The reason that healthcare.gov crashed, as um, was cited earlier, is because it, if, you, if you only got one answer, it is the one that was quoted, I, I believe, anyhow, that they took IT people and they made them, or they basically they stood up and said that I think we can design this thing. And they played the general contractor role and they sliced the different parts of the system up into different pieces each of which they then farmed out to a, a contracting firm. And that, that can work, it's not perfect. In fact, in, our organiz in the organization I lead, I have a team of about 5,000 full-time and 14,000 contractors. And I wanna switch mm -hmm. that over to be the exact opposite. And the reason is it's very difficult, <coughs> even in the best of contractors, to get visibility deep down into what they're mm -hmm. doing with the code and you know, I have a you know, I trust my my full time folks implicitly, and I still want to know under, understand all the way down what what's going on. And so, you're kind of set up to fail if you um, first you have an IT f set of folks who'd never built one of these things before, but they have this I'll call it hubris that says, oh, I, we think we can build this thing, and then they farm out the basic piece, pieces. Which if they if you had um, great uh, um, uh, people who could advise you, kind of the, that confidant that really knew how to build one of these things and could see, call, could call bull on things that they w were doing, you'd be in better shape. And they didn't have those people. And so the, this is a long way of saying that the problems were purely, were largely technical. The actual space is fraught with political issues. For instance, you know, the first place that I went when I went there was to the security people. Because the first thing that I thought, I thought if they'd had a security breach, it would have been the end of healthcare.gov, full stop. Because the Republicans would have had, would, would have been able to argue that your, your information is not safe with the government, you sure, sure shouldn't be giving this personal identifiable information, game over. And so we got that under control. That's kind of a policy thing, but not really. And so you do worry uh, in a few places where um, it's possible that the policy could be cause you, you need to consider the policy to make sure you do things in the right order. But security, I think, is foremost regardless. There are some other places where people didn't challenge the um, questions about whether you could go a different way well enough because there's such a, a stated process. So for instance, um, what happens is you build a law, and I'm by no means an expert here, but you write a law, the law gets enacted, and the next thing it does is it goes through a process of defining how it gets implemented in regulation. And this process takes, it could take a year to actually, and that, the regulation actually specifies in good detail how it's going to happen. And so I came on the project, and you looked at some of the regulation that had been created, and you say, technically it is impossible for you to do what you're suggesting. Or not impossible, but the probability of failure is massive. And so for instance, what they, one of the suggestions they had is the law um, is really, I am biased um, for multiple reasons. I'm a Democrat and I help fix this thing and I think that I just personally believe people have a right to health care. But um, the law is actually very clever in that it says that in an insurance market where you set it up this way, there are multiple ways in which uh, profitability will not naturally accrue to all people in proportion to their investment. And so for instance, um, people would propose a, um, a plan, that plan would get approved, an insurance plan, and then anybody who mm -hmm. wanted to could sign up for it. And so there's actually no way to compensate for adverse selection. And that adverse selection can happen where you get sicker people, essentially. That can happen to one plan versus yeah. another. And so the, 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 law, the reg, law and regulation actually accommodated that. And so, but then they took it a step further when they went on to regulation. They said, we're going to, and this is kind of the IT hubris again, we're going to design a, a, a server 
and we're going to build the algorithms for doing these compensations. There was a balancing that went on. If you had higher claims than another, then you got compensated. If you had a higher risk pool than another, you got compensated. If the overall profitability of everybody was too low, then the whole pool got compensated, which is actually pretty rational. But then they wanted to create this server application, and then they said, we're just going to give it to you on a server. And you're going to plug it into your data center, into mm. your internal data centers. There is no insurance company on the planet, particularly when yeah. we've mm. just crashed healthcare.gov, that's going to take this server and say, yeah, I'm fine with you plugging that in. Yeah, just plug it into my net. I, don't, yeah. I trust you. <laughs> and so that's a case where we basically had to go back to the, to the people who built the regulation and say, you've got to change this. The first, uh, well, part of this is my own opinion. I think blockchain or Bitcoin for its own is like, I think it's tulips in Holland at this point. Um, <laughs> and I think if you, I don't know this statistic and I what, asked What does tulips in Holland mean? That, that might be a tough one for some people. Well, yeah. somebody, somebody will know the date. Um, oh, okay. 16, late 1600s, 1700s, yeah. I'm not sure where, but there was speculation went on in tulip bulbs yeah, in Holland, yeah. and it went to, and it, tulip bulbs <laughs> became incredibly valuable, and then went crashed. Okay. <laughs> so I'm sure somebody else, somebody in the audience can give me a great articulation, of, but that's the, <laughs> ge the gist of it. And I think um, the only statistic you have to look at to, to prove this, I, you can't prove it because it hasn't happened yet, or, is that the amount of transaction volume that's happening in Bitcoin for um, just trading wor wealth versus actual underlying transactions. Yeah, I think the stuff. vast majority of it is in trading back and forth, mm -hmm. which means you're more speculating than you are using it as a transaction currency. Mm -hmm. um, we don't think that we want to get into the currency market. Uh, we don't think that's our competency. We do actually, are ve we are very bullish about blockchain, though. Mm -hmm. Um, we are just not sure what industries are going to take off with or what particular transactions are going to take off with blockchain. There are certain, certain ones where the centralization of, of financial transactions is very efficient. And so I don't know that there's necessarily a need mm -hmm. um, for distributed transaction ledgers, but there are other places, I don't know whether it's real estate or other places where it will actually be great to have not to have to have intermediaries or, or an, a centralized authority um, doing those kinds of transactions. So what we focus on is making Azure and the infrastructure of Azure, our cloud mm -hmm. um, uh, set of capabilities or services, great for blockchain. And so we are working with industry players to think through and actually implement some of those particular blockchain solutions um, rather than you know, doing a cryptocurrency ourselves. It could be uh, it could be cryptocurrencies take off. Yeah. I'm not, just we don't have to make that bet. Our view on AI is, and um, I believe it as well, is that there are multiple things we need to do to to be successful as a company of the scale of Microsoft. We need to build a great platform for AI because we're not going to build all these solutions on top of it. Machine learning, for instance, is something that is relevant to all of our customers. Deep neural networks is something that's relevant to all of our customers. Image recognition is, is a, something that all of our customers should be able to take advantage of. And so we will build in Azure and in uh, our cognitive services that sit on top, we want to be the leaders in the platform uh, in terms of building AI-based applications. Um, but then the, ex the next thing that will happen is that these techniques will exist um, in all of the software that we build, and I think in all the software that all of you consume in, in uh, the future. So for example, in Office, we've already built um, what's called the Office Graph, which basically if you, if you subscribe to Office 365, then you, not, your, not anybody else using Office 365, have a graph on top of it which has connectedness between, you know, for instance, if I wanted to find who a particular expert was about a particular topic, it could say, these are people who talk about hmm. that particular topic. It would be able to say, hey, if you wanted to find a certain person that can help you on a particular topic, this person um, can be, is connected to this person who ultimately is connected to this person who knows about that topic. And so you can imagine a set of, um, of applications that, that would take advantage of that graph. You can imagine also, and one of the rationales for buying LinkedIn was that is a graph in and of itself. Mm -hmm. That is the public equivalent of the Office graph, as, which is your private one to own as, as the business user of Office 365. And the, 
merging of those two and inferencing over that to find me every where the trends are in terms of capabilities that that's happening in society is fascinating as well. We did um, we model, for instance, we look at as a slight aside, we've looked at what the job openings are of our competitors as a way as a proxy for what they're investing mm -hmm. in internally. <laughs> and that's just building a machine learning model on top of data that you usually would not have thought of to do that. And so all of these kinds of applications will permeate everything that we do, and then they'll permeate the user experience as well. And so the ability to have an agent that, that within the context of your writing a resume helps you write that resume based on your experiences, that will just, certainly our kids, that will be, yeah, of course, don't they all do that? And so that'll be those, it will definitely permeate everything that we do. Now the whole scariness of does AI take over the world, I think we're a ways from that. <laughs> um, so I'm not necessarily in the Elon Musk camp yeah. of, of that I'm worried about that now. I think it is a concern. I think ethics and having a policy around who owns what data and for what purpose is very important. That's something yeah, Microsoft. Seen that data. Yeah, yeah, Microsoft has spent a bunch of time on. The place AI will be used by some of our competitors is looking at everything that you do and inferencing a bunch of other products they think should be sold to you. And they'll get deeper and deeper in terms of you know, coming up with clever ideas and what the other connections are of things they could do, for, quote unquote, for you. And we've taken a stance that we think that your data is your data. Um, and we can only do things that help our service be better um, mm -hmm. with, with the data that you have. But I think, so that's a long-winded way of saying I am very bullish about the capability of AI to deliver new solutions, but um, mm -hmm. we're, I'm not worried yet. As we look at each and every position, and we look at internal people that could apply for that or that would be relevant that are in that team already. We look at parallel organizations that have skills that are similar that could be transferred and that so there's a set of people that are within the org that the nat natural successor would come up, successor would come up. There are people in parallel organizations that would happen and then there are the people that we want to they're ripe for that next promotion and they have broad skills like my some of the people in my team the, the potential successors come from the Windows organization or they come from the Office organization because we try to rotate, as I said, that team builds the core services that are internally used. They will have ideas that can be used within to make our s internal systems better as well. And so they'll come from there as well. And then the final place they come from is from people in industry. And we, uh, we encourage everybody once they get to a certain senior leadership level and earlier on for that matter to know people broader that mm -hmm. you would want to bring into Microsoft. <laughs> and so in most cases, for instance, there's some places where it's really, really important to get that industry experience like um, our CISO, Chief Information Security Officer. You better believe that there are other experts in the industry that could bring new things to Microsoft mm -hmm. in the security yeah. realm. Other places, you actually don't want to take somebody from, some, in some of uh, the areas that I'm in, I'm trying to transform the team so much that I actually don't want uh, a more, I don't typically want a more traditional IT leader. And so I'm looking more towards product development leaders as well. So that's kind of what we do. And then what we do along the way then, once we identify these people, we have high potential people that we're explicitly trying to figure out where do we place their, them next in their career so that they move up the ladder. What we don't do is a lot of this kind, some companies think that this whole idea of rotation across multiple um, areas is a good thing. Um, and we're not actually of that school. I'm not sure, I've never ex lived in that kind of a world to know whether it's a good thing or not, but we don't do that. We basically just say, let's put he or she in that next role and let's do it proactively. We also look for people who have been in a particular area for too long and we think they're talented, but they just have gotten a little, it's not that they get, they've gotten stale, they have the potential of getting stale, and we'll move them to something completely different too. Let's go on the other end of the spectrum, and again, we've got a large number of students here. So, uh, you just talked about what Microsoft looks at in developing leadership. What do they look at for new employees? Mm -hmm. And then, what do those employees should be doing to get to the, to be on the list, to be considered right. to move up? Well. You know, the typical Microsoft interview, which is traditional, I think it's become, I think in a lot of ways, the quote unquote, what's considered the computer science interview started with Microsoft. 
because we were earlier on, and not that there was some brilliant thing we did, but it was just we were the earliest progenitors or the fir first people doing that kind of a thing. And so it is the typical, if you're a developer, we will ask you coding questions. And you will, um, mm -hmm. uh, now it's done over Skype. And in real time, you'll have to write out code for, uh, to f solve a particular problem. They're typically algorithmic. And so it'll like, the simple ones are like, you know, reverse a doubly linked list. But then we'll go deeper and saying, what's the order of operations? How would you make it faster? What are the boundary conditions you missed, et cetera? In program management, we will look to people who are good at problem solving. And so it will be, you know, either uh, kind of conundrums or it'll be, if you had this particular product, how would you make it better? I was in one interview long, long ago where somebody pointed at a telephone and said, if you had that telephone, how would you make it better? And you're not so much thinking about the particular features, although you should exhibit creativity in, you know, if you got open air, you can do, come up with anything you want. It's also about how you think about it, and do you logically break the question down into what is somebody trying to use this for? What are the broader use cases that this is one example mm -hmm. of? What are the competitors likely doing? Where is the industry going? And so it, it, you get into things that are very specific to that um, area. Once you get into Microsoft, um, it, is, you know, it is a meritocracy. And above all, we try to have a very fair system that brings, that allows people that have greater skills to kind of rise and get promoted more quickly. Um, we are, we do, we don't, we used to have a scale where there was a forced grading. We don't have that anymore. We, um, there's not a fi lower 5% that mm -hmm. would get, you know, mm -hmm. asked to leave Out. the organ. There are people who still do that. We don't do that anymore. But um, people mostly will figure out from their own trajectory in the company whether mm -hmm. they think that they should look for other opportunities. That, and, but we do everything we can do to kind of help move them up. And there's a lot of coaching that goes on when you're not performing as well as you should. It's a, you know, it is that, I think it's a good balance between um, an organization that's very focused on accomplishing things and has that as its mindset with being a humane place that says, mm -hmm. you know, we want to we want to get the most out of everybody. Well, I think um, I, I certainly think we haven't played out some of the themes that are that exist so far in the industry. I think that the whole notion of mobility will move from if you think about the combination of data being omnipresent nowadays mm -hmm. um, with mobile devices, I think you can get to this point where it knows everything about me and helps me do things in a way that software does not the do The personal today. assistant, literally. Yeah, right, the, yeah. how <laughs> the, the average personal assistant is not very personal and it's yeah. not very assistive. <laughs> so other than that, uh, it's a great concept, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, uh -huh. And so I think we'll finally break through on that. I think AI is gonna do amazing things in terms of helping there, helping you get tasks accomplished. It will, I believe, some of the more routine tasks will, will fall away. And so um, I think administrative assistance um, will be able to focus more on adding value to the work of the teams they work with. And we'll have to do less of the drudgery of figuring out when this person's available and this person's available, all of them combined with this office being mm -hmm. or this conference room being available. Those kinds of tasks, I think, are ripe for automation. Um, I do think, uh, much to my chagrin, that autonomous cars, I hopefully not race cars, will, because um, that kind of blows the point, I think, a little bit. Um, but I think autonomous driving will be here. I, I firmly believe it. Um, uh, what else? I think all data centers, this is... What's Microsoft's play in autonomous vehicles? We want to be, it's, this is a longer discussion, but yeah. we believe the place for a place for, uh, like us to, to thrive and to help car manufacturers is by being the cloud platform that they ah, connect to okay. and being the set of services like image recognition and just compute services that they rely on. And we think that, the, and I believe this firmly, that if I'm Ford, GM, Audi, Mercedes-Benz, the last thing I want to do is have my car run on somebody else's software stack. Yeah. And so I don't think, I think they will have to, by hook or by crook, come up with their own stack for how, they lead, how their car drives. But I do believe all computing, the vast majority of computing will be out of corporate specific data centers and in the cloud. I think that will drive a huge amount of growth um, in our industry overall. So cloud will be a, a big area. I'm very bullish about where medical science will go. Mm -hmm. I think AI and modeling there, um, the fact that you can now 
um, get very deep the, into the human genome. We've already got targeted um, diagnostics mm -hmm. where we can, you know, there are people working on um, being able to sample your blood and finding the very first damaged cells that show up from cancer. Right. And that will mean that cancer will be both detected sooner and that then you'll get a very prescriptive um, treatment for it that will be very specific to your cancer. I think all of that will be, in 10 years, will all be commonplace. Right. So I, well, I know I've we never can, been more bullish about where the tech yeah, industry is going. We can already do some of that already, in, in the existence of certain chemicals in the blood that uh, is the pre-trigger. Right. And then we use the human immune system to solve the problem rather than uh, other kinds of strategies. Exactly. So. so yeah, great. you're going into a great field, and it's it permeates everything. I mean, one of the things that we have been espousing is that all products end up software products in the future. And <laughs> if you think about a car, the Tesla, the Tesla is a software product essentially, and it has a mechanical aspect to yeah, it. Yeah, there's some mechanical software, stuff in there. Yeah. Software is at its core. <laughs> and electrical stuff too. But yeah, 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 and there's electric. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, in that kind yeah. of a world. This melding together of that is not a statement that we will build all this stuff. No. It's basically saying everybody having the ability to understand this, the the ability to program even physical objects will be a core of what those objects are yeah. in the future.